Thanks. Cool. So today I'm going to kind of be talking about doing production integration tests, uh, kind of chaos monkey style using Terraform. Or how we actually can monitor applications that are deployed in eight different data centers at the same time. <laughs> um, it's funny, this is my first time to Amsterdam, and um, I didn't realize the biggest cultural shock was going to be learning how to use the Wi Fi passwords. The lady at the coffee shop said this word like six times, and I eventually just had her have her write it down. <laughs> and I was eventually able to get on the Wi Fi, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, just really quick about me. Uh, I'm a uh, tech lead on the metrics backend at DigitalOcean. I have a uh, book called Microservices and Go that's coming out this year, and uh, I live in Bangkok. So for those of you that don't know, uh, DigitalOcean is a cloud platform, kind of like Amazon or Google. Uh, we kind of focus on developer happiness. Um, and we have eight different data centers, and every time we deploy applications, we need to be able to deploy and monitor these applications. Um, which can get really tricky. So w one of the things that we've been, we were kind of looking at when I started about a year ago was how can we start to introduce chaos testing into our environment? And um, who here knows about chaos testing or is doing some actively doing? Oh, great, like the majority of the audience. So, so just really quick, chaos testing is basically something Netflix uh, kind of invented. And basically, it's testing failure conditions in your production environment, running integration tests, and actively destroying things in your production environment, um, making things sure that your service discovery and your failovers are actually working in your production environment. So kind of the application that I work on is the Cloud Metrics project. Um, basically, Basically, we have millions of virtual machines that are deployed on our cloud. And for each of these virtual machines, we collect you know, 40 to 100 different metrics. And we have to be able to give these to the users. Now, these metrics are stored in applications that are local to each data center. So if a single data center goes out, you don't lose the metrics from the other data centers. Um, so when I kind of came on this project, the project had been kind of old. And we had it monitored. But we were kind of doing monitoring kind of a very old-fashioned way. And we were using um, Nagios. And as you know, Nagios is kind of a good tool. But basically, Nagios is just saying, hey, is the app up or down? And what we were finding was a lot of times the app was up, but users had problems. And for us, our users really love our service, but they're also very vocal. So what would happen is somebody would complain, oh, I can't see my charts, and it would be on Twitter. And kind of our rule of thumb is if somebody complains on Twitter, we've totally failed at this point. Like, if our customers get to that point. So we said we have to step back and we say, how can we actually make sure that we can monitor these applications and make sure that we know about the problems before the customers ever see any kind of issues? So, so this is kind of the GUI of the application. It's pretty simple. It's just your charts and your graphs. If you've used any kind of product like CloudWatch or Datadog, it's, it's kind of very similar in that vein. It's, it's, it's just really nothing crazy there. Um, so it's kind of a very traditional microservice architecture. So we have three or four different microservices. We have a, a couple MySQL databases, and then we have a console cluster, and we have metrics databases in each data center. And kind of we're doing service discovery very traditionally with console, so every application in the cluster is registering itself with cluster with console, and all the communication to find the microservices is through there. Um, so how did we we wanted to get from we wanted to start our we wanted to start our testing setup. And we wanted to really get from Nagios right here to kind of where we're at today, which is this is our Canary UI. Our Canary UI is basically a set of production integration tests that run across, I think, 12 different platforms across eight different data centers. So this, is, this matrix can get incredibly large. 
but it's pretty awesome is that we can kind of scale up new production integration tests and run them against every single kind of configuration across all of our data centers. And, I, and, and kind of what I want to talk about today is how we got from where we just had HTTP checks to where we actually were running uh, chaos testing in production. Um, so this is, this is kind of a funny quote that I kind of made up, is whenever we start talking about chaos testing, everybody is always so excited. They're like, yeah, Netflix is doing it. It's awesome. But you, you, who really wants to just go around and turn off their databases in production? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I was a little bit nervous. Oh, this, this guy does. <laughs> he, he looks excited. <laughs> um, but that, that's where it is. You're like, oh, but how, that's, that sounds too hard. How do I get there, right? And I kind of wanted to just break down the kind of steps that we did because it wasn't crazy, but it, just, it, it was just a lot of little steps. And, and we wanted to start to crawl before we run. Um, and what do I mean by that? So I assume everybody here does test-driven development? Only like four hands. OK, so maybe everybody else is just tired, I hope, maybe. <laughs> so, so you know, a lot of our tests when we started out were just unit tests, right? And you know, the first kind of baby step was just moving everything over to integration tests. And, and you're like, oh, but that's kind of silly. But the, the thing is, is that by starting out getting the integration tests, we were able to kind of abstract our tests from the actual running system. And we were, and basically, we gave ourselves some runway to start being able to reuse our integration tests in our production environment. And I'll, I'll talk about how we got there. Um, so, so kind of how we started out was we had these integration tests. So the integration tests would spin up a couple of our microservices in Docker, in Vagrant, on our local machines, and be able to like, run through some tests, like you know, call, send metrics to uh, the microservice, make sure that if, if the MySQL is up, all these kinds of things. Just kind of very standard integration tests. And then we started the second round of tests that we needed to add locally, which was failure tests. And who, who here actually, when they write integration tests, you guys add like failure tests too to your? Only a, only a couple people. Somebody's like squinting in the audience. Maybe he doesn't know what I'm talking about. So kind of what failure integration tests are, it's like it's not the unhappy path. It's the really bad path. So you spin up your integration environment and say you have a MySQL master and a MySQL slave and an Elasticsearch cluster. Well, what happens if middle of an integration test, you kill the MySQL? Well, you should know the, na the known failure conditions. Either your app should start to read from the MySQL slave, or it should be returning an error. And these are the kind of like very consistent tests that are not chaotic that we needed to add into our integration test suite. Um, and, and kind of part of all this is a lot of our teams internally were doing a lot of mocking. We even had things like we had a, a mocked file system on one project. And it got to really extreme levels. And basically, we had to remove all of the mocking to even be able to get to the point where we could do any of this. Um, OK, so now, now that we're at this point, now we're kind of at like, we're kind of crawling now. We're kind of crawling. We have integration tests that are running on our CI. Hopefully, a good portion of the audience is kind of already at this point, right? All right, so now we, we, made, we started our canary. And basically, what our Canary app is, and what we'll have, we should open source this, actually. But basically, what our Canary app does is it allows you to take Terraform and be able to take a configuration list and say, OK, I want to spin up servers in all these data centers. And basically, we, what we did was we took really one baby step. And we took one integration test, and we, and we, we put it as a binary on our Terraform. And we ran it in our production environment. And basically, what the test was, was we would spin up a virtual machine, have it send metrics into our server, and then call our API backends to actually be able to extract that data. 
it was really simple. So like with maybe like 50 lines of Terraform, we were able to like set this up and actually start to, to actually um, start running these tests. So, so what, what, what kind of happened first? So we get these tests running, and we're like, great, this is awesome. Uh, so we, we start to add Slack integration. And what's the first thing that happened? All day long, we just get errors in our Slack, right? <laughs> like, all you see. And, and basically, what's going to happen when you start this is you're going to have two weeks of just getting out every little kink. So you won't believe how many little issues there were. Um, so, so basically, we found a lot of issues. We found that actually in one of our regions in Singapore, the VM creation times were actually like 90 seconds when they should be 60 seconds. And that was like creating our tests. Um, we, you'll find that sometimes your DNS, arch your DNS is not as good as you think. We actually found out that the 59th minute of every hour, the DNS would blip. <laughs> um, little, little things like this that you find and you start to dig in. But I think the two big ones that everybody's going to see, and th these are the really the hardest ones to deal with, are your API slowness and if, if a database gets slow. And this, what we started to address with this was we started to really build in metrics, deep metrics into all of our APIs. Um, so who here is using like Graphite or a StatsD? Oh, wow, half the audience. OK, anybody here using Prometheus? All right, OK. Yeah, so we're a Prometheus shop. And who here uses Influx? Only one guy. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a different audience. Sometimes it's like half the audience. Is, um, so what we started to do was we added the tests. So we, we started to add the metrics of our API response times. And that was part of the test. So what would happen was, if I pull up uh, the Canary UI, the Canary is also dumping steps into our Prometheus metrics. So what we can see is that for each data center, we can actually see what the client thinks the API request times are, and we can see what the, the server thinks the API requests are. So sometimes if you're on a platform like Heroku or some of the other platforms where you don't have as much control, sometimes you'll find out that what you think on the server side is not the actual performance that your canaries are getting. Um, and we, we found a lot of times where the canary would find cases where we would lose API calls on the back end. And we were able to really dig into a lot of these issues. Um, the other kind of thing that we, we started to do is we started to do distributed tracing. Um, who here is, has anybody done distributed tracing before? There's one guy that like, shakes it. OK, that's good. I'm glad I'm going to talk about this. So basically, once you start doing like, a lot of microservices, you're going to start having problems where, well, how do I track the logs between my microservices? And one of the ways you can do this is with distributed tracing. So essentially, what would happen was our clients would pass a GUID, like an identifier, to our first microservice. And then each microservice would pass that GUID along. And everybody, whenever they logged messages, they would, they would dump the, the GUID into the, the message. And we could actually use Kibana to actually like, be able to trace through the application logs. So when we have a failure, we could actually find out that maybe it was the second or third microservice that was failing. Um, and it's just a lot of these little things that started to add up to where we could actually really dig into the system and find these problems. But I want to I want to step back because we, we kind of built the system, but we started to have a lot of pain because when we originally write code, right, we, we know the unit tests take a couple seconds to run, and then the integration tests maybe take a minute to run. But when we needed to do the the, the Terraform actual production test. It could take five minutes, because you would have to spin up three or four different virtual machines. You would have to be able to like, call different API backends. You would have to run the whole integration test. Each integration test might make a minute. Um, so this was actually our biggest pain point, was the actual development time and actual testing. 
And, and, and I, I would love to hear from anybody in the audience maybe later afterwards is one of the issues we had was there wasn't a great way to test locally and, and not have to spin up VMs in the cloud. So basically all of our unit testing or all of our testing locally was always having to spin up these VMs in the cloud. And, and maybe somebody has like a good way of handling that, but that was kind of one of the, the things that still kind of really bothers us about this setup is every time we add new tasks or trying to debug our tests, it's, it's, it's a very painfully slow process. Um, just talked about this. So one of the cool things we, we, we did with, uh, with Terraform is um, we had a problem because we were building we were building out a new storage project. And we needed to do some performance testing. And what we ended up doing is we ended up writing some custom Terraform providers. And what was cool is we could spin up a separate data center, and we would use Terraform to spin up a second performance cluster. So we, because we couldn't actually do our performance tests on the live production cluster. And what Terraform would do is we would, we would have it spin up our, all of our API servers, the console servers, MySQL, all of this. And then we would do our performance tests and, and run that. And what we can do is we can actually run our performance tests on a daily basis and actually hook in our performance tests into our CI environment. Um, but that was, not without, uh, that was not without a lot of pain. <laughs> So as this, this is an example, this is one of our test clusters, is um, we, we started to have a lot of pain on, on actually building these things. Um, one of the biggest issues that we had was console. We'd have, if you spawn multiple console clusters, sometimes they join each other because <laughs> they're, doing, they're, do, they're doing a lot of gossiping, and you'll find that they join each other. So, we had to make sure that we had to give like each data center virtual data center names and make sure that we had different encryption keys for every time we set up a new cluster. Otherwise, the clusters would join each other, and it would just cause chaos. And basically, one time, one of our test clusters actually joined our production cluster, which, <laughs> as you can imagine, is, like, is not, it's not a good thing. Um, but that, that's something you just need to worry about. Like, either you need to be really good about making sure that your network environments are isolated, or you need to make sure that the console setup is very isolated from using encryption keys. Um, so for, for randomly killing nodes, we, we never got, we, we still don't in production. We have, our, we, have our, we, have a, we have a we have a production environment that only beta customers use, and that we can do killing of nodes. We, we haven't gotten to the place yet, and this is where we're working towards is where we actually kill production environments. But when we kill nodes in the actual in the beta environment, we can actually start to run these tests and this is, this is actually in the middle of, of, of killing nodes and trying to figure this out. Um, I think the biggest challenge about this is actually the databases and the products you use. Um, some of the underlying tools like console worked really well. Like you can kill console nodes and the cluster stays pretty good. The microservices were pretty easy. Um, MySQL was really the hardest. And getting MySQL into a scenario where you can actually do failovers and, and masters very cleanly is, is We've, we've largely, we're slowly giving up on that, and we're, we're actually moving over to Cassandra now. And if you really want to be in an environment where you want to be able to kill random nodes of your database, you really have to start using one of the distributed databases. Um, if, I, I would love to hear other people's opinions if they were able to get MySQL in a highly available environment where nodes could go down. I mean, the slaves obviously can go down, but having multiple masters and being able to fail over masters, we do it. but. It, it, it just always felt really kind of nasty. Um, the other thing we have done is we've started to use console as a key value store for a lot of things. So console is really good as a replicated key value store. So we use that a lot of places where we were used to using MySQL to be able to have highly available stores that can go down in the middle of um, failure testing. Um, yeah, so 
just kind of to wrap up on this point, um, we can now spin up clusters on the command with, with Terraform. Uh, we can do chaos to the cluster, but it still has to be in a kind of a beta environment. As we start to move to Cassandra, we'll be able to get away from that and be able to do that more in our production environment. And we're able to reuse the integration tests that we run on our local environment in the production environment, which is really fun. Um, what's next? Um, Flappy tests. So anybody here that runs CI knows tests occasionally fail, right? So sometimes you have a test that has like some timing issues or some kind of issue, and it will occasionally fail. Maybe it fails one out of 100 times, and that's OK. But maybe you introduce a code change, and now it fails 30 out of 100 times. But you don't notice, because that test was always kind of failing occasionally. And what I haven't seen and what I would love to see is if one of the CI tools could actually be able to know about flappy tests, be able to have some kind of statistical variance on flappy tests, and be able to report on that. So you could at least know. So because it's really hard sometimes to be perfectly green on all of your tests, especially when you're doing any kind of failure or chaos testing. And, and that's, that's really been our biggest problem is it kind of sometimes will keep us up at night because we think that there are failures that have not actually happened. But it's still better than getting t angry tweets saying, why is your service working? So <laughs> um, I want to have, have some time now. Uh, I want to open it up for some questions. <laughs> 